Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host, and we have an interesting show tonight. Uh, Alejandro is out in Las Vegas. He's at the NAB show, the National Broadcaster something American Broadcast. Oh, hey, hey, that was Lee in the background, and Lee, um, Lee is going to be helping out uh, with with UFO d updates. And uh, you know, dang it, I might just fire that Alejandro. I like Lee so much. So anyway, Lee's helping out with that. Uh, I want to thank everyone that supports the show. Anyone can help us out uh, for $2 or more a month. If you can't, you can listen to the full show live, uh, always on Wednesday night at 8 to, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can also listen over at the Dark Matter Digital Network, and that's every Thursday, and that's 10 to midnight, and that's also Eastern Standard Time as well. And uh, anyway... Um, I guess we're just going to roll right into it, and uh, I can't think of anything, anything else to say except hello, Lee. Hello, Martin. I, I, I'm so glad to be here. What I was trying to say before, that NAB you mentioned is uh, means the, the National Association of Broadcasters, because I used to go to the NAB conventions when I was in the radio world. Ah, and, yeah. And there's a lot of really good things that happen there. I can understand why... Alejandro's there. He's probably trying to drum up some business for Open Minds. Yeah, absolutely. And he said it's really fun to look at all the gadgets and every everything there. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's supposed to be pretty spectacular, from what I understand. And yeah. can you imagine the technology today compared to the probably the last time you went? It must be really oh. different. Oh, oh, of course, it's leaps and bounds. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine. It's like, it's like a candy store for people like you and me. Right, right. So, you know, we're going to, uh, just to let the live um, listener know on YouTube, you can see that we have a, uh, there's a flickering going on on uh, Lee's side of the screen. We're not sure. Uh, this has to do, I guess, with the, my latest Mac update is the only thing that's changed. So there may be some type of conflicting problem with the software. So bear with us on that. This audio should be just fine. Um, so um, anyway, Lee, uh you are working with James Fox, and someone just wrote me last week, and they said, "When is seven hundred one coming out?" It's not called seven hundred one anymore. Is that, there is that, there that, that's right. is it's there a working such. title now for that yet? Yeah, th th there is a working title, and and it is now called UFOs: What We Now Know. Ah, uh, it was called seven hundred one based on the number of unknowns. That were left over from the uh, the Air Force's Project Blue Book days. They had more than twelve thousand reports that they had looked at uh, the Air Force over a 20, 20 year period, and of those twelve thousand plus, there were seven hundred and one left over that were just considered unknown, unidentified, unexplained. Right. And and so when when James started working on this documentary, the working title was going to be seven oh one. Uh, but we've it's gone through some changes. I've come on board, and and as a co-producer with uh, with James, and I'm happy to say that uh, this is going to be a different kind of documentary. That uh, people are going to really go, wow, I didn't know that, or wow, show me that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that uh, um, you've got a really good budget, and if any listeners out there have ever watched Out of the Blue. Or I know what I saw. Uh, those are just those are my two favorite, and they're you know there's a couple of crossovers between the two, but um, absolutely fantastic. And this one is going to top that by far, which is uh, really exciting. I can't wait till that comes out. Well, Anita can I? <laughs> I, I bet. And, I, and, I, and I'm involved with it. Uh, this is going to be the the the, uh, the third installment of James's uh, UFO trilogy. And it, it's going to, there are going to be things in this, many things that will take the breath away of both believers and skeptics, we think, be, because we're really going for total integrity, total credibility, um, which is not something you get in a lot of uh, filmed productions these days or in recent years. And I'm on board because if, if, if James and I hadn't come to an agreement that this is how we were going to put this thing together, uh, I don't think either one of us would have wanted to start it in the first place. Yeah. Uh, Can you give us any type of teasers of any any part of it? I, I will give you a, a one teaser that um, the opening sequence of the film 
is is going to make everybody crazy. Every time I look at it, and and I already know what it looks like, I go crazy looking at it. It's, and, and all that I will say is that it involves a real, very close encounter and pursuit of a UFO going back to the 1950s. Uh, it was a, it was a real event, and and how how we've come to put this thing together will will blow you away. It, it blows me away every time I look at it, and it's it sets the tone for the rest of the movie, and that's why we're doing it as the the very opening sequence of it. Yeah, yeah, you told me the details about that. Uh, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so. Uh, do you have anything we can talk about in the way of uh, UFO events, recent events? You know, there, there was there was something that caught my eye. Um, it was an incident that took place over southern Arizona uh, near the end of February, and it was in the middle of the afternoon, and and it involved pilots uh, in two separate aircraft uh, who reported seeing a mysterious flying object above their planes. The, uh, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, released a flight recording uh, to the public. And, and in this recording, uh, one pilot who was with the Phoenix Air Group was at the controls of a Lear jet. And he was at 37,000 feet. Uh, and he asked uh, an air traffic controller if they had just tracked anyone above them uh, about 30 seconds ago. And the response from the official at the uh, the FAA's Albuquerque Center was simply, quote, negative, you know, like you might expect them to say. And then the pilot then said, okay, but something did, <laughs> end quote, like something did, you know, show up here. Then um, just a few minutes later, uh, an, an American Airlines pilot reported seeing the same unexplained object passing right over the top of their jet at about 40,000 feet uh, above the uh, the Arizona Sonoran Desert. And the pilot said that the object uh, had a big reflection and it was going in the opposite direction of the jet. Now, while, while there's been no uh, immediate follow-up about this event, because really when something like that happens and something goes so fast, either approaching your jet, going above it, going to the side, and if it's not captured or imaged by radar it's it's hard to to tell exactly what this was um but what what it does in my mind it, it brings up the uh the, the, the always possible uh discussion about well just how safe are the friendly skies mm -hmm. you, you know and and not not just for for passengers but whether for commercial airliners for military jet fighter pilots um, and in, in this case, the FAA said that they had not been aware of any kind of military activity or weather balloons in the air at that time. So, so even though we don't know what it was, it doesn't sound like the planet Venus, especially <laughs> if it was going in the opposite direction, you know? Yeah, and, I, I and, know. There's, there's some great audio on that. Uh, I think I had that at some point, but I don't have it right now, but... Um, yeah, they they're definitely talking about something going on there, and, and uh, uh, the audio, by the way, you, you probably already know this, but it was uh, it was released by the FAA on that in particular, which is very uh, yeah. unusual. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, especially coming on the heels of uh, of the Pentagon yeah. release of those first two uh, jet fighter pilot films um, that came out in the middle of December. Uh, that and that made such a big splash. It actually it went viral instantly. I mean, everybody in the news industry was talking about it, showing the films over and over again. And and part of the big discussion about that was, well, why? Why is the Pentagon releasing this kind of information? You would think that the government or the military would not want to suddenly acknowledge that we had UFOs on film. Uh, that that's it wasn't just so much that the that the uh, the New York Times broke the story. In and of itself, I believe that was the first time in the history of the New York Times that they released a front page story about UFOs. So th there were like all all different kinds of firsts about this. But like you just said, uh, the fact that the FAA 
released this this recording. They didn't have to. That they were they were going to gain nothing by it except for further discussion, more controversy, more questions. What like what's going on? What's happening in the skies above our planet? Why are you telling us that there may be something up there that we can't we can't stop, we can't catch, we can't outmaneuver? Why are you letting us know instead of continuing to lie about it or deny it? Right, like the Air Force always had. Yeah, uh, you know, basically because um, who would want to admit they didn't have control over what's going on in the skies when they're supposed to protect it? Y yes, yeah. well, and and you know, there, there's another thing you and I have talked about before about this this whole idea uh, about pilots. Pilots in general won't report UFOs. And people are always asking me about that and asking, well, why won't they talk about it? Well, c certainly it could severely limit uh, their credibility uh, and threaten their very nice, high-paying jobs if they were to start talking openly about this thing that, that, that played tag with their aircraft while they were trying to, to fly, you know, 300 people from one location to another. And also, why, why would any of the major airlines want to fuel any speculation about ufos to the public or the general media this this wouldn't be good for business it sure wouldn't that you know a lot of people may not fly i mean you know i never really thought of it in that in that way but that certainly makes sense um well you know uh, and i've talked with pilots i've talked with many pilots over the years who said to me look I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose my pension, and 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 for and, and why why would the American public and again not just the American public, Martin? It's like why would the the citizens of this planet want to continue uh, flying if they thought that that there might be an an event that could happen that could that could affect the security of that flight or the national security of whatever country that they're flying over at the time? There's a lot of implications here about UFOs. And I'm frankly surprised that the, the, the military and the FAA would have released this kind of information. Now, there, there are people who will say, well, this is all part of disclosure. Disclosure is right around the corner. Well, no. First of all, I say to people that there's already been disclosure. If you want to know some of the answers, some little, little bits of the truth about UFOs, you can find it. You got to do some legwork. You've got to do some reading. You've got to do some research. Uh, you've got to listen to more shows with people like Martin Willis, uh, who will bring people on, who will talk about the kinds of things that have shown there has already been disclosure. Now, but on the other hand, if people say, "Well, the truth about UFOs is right around the corner," no, I don't think so. Not in my lifetime, at least, because UFOs have been such a complex issue going way back in time historically that we we just don't know all the answers and I don't think the countries of the world know all the answers about what this thing is that's flying around in our skies um, but countries don't want to have to admit to their citizens that this is going on we're a little concerned about how it might affect our national security but please Go about your daily business. Go, go live your daily lives, and we'll take care of you. <laughs> now, there's there's only been a handful of situations that there's a possible attribution to interference um, while someone was flying. The one that uh, you actually interviewed, uh, Coin, uh, that had to do with the military helicopter. That's right. one. Uh, the possible UFO uh, encounter over Australia with the young kid that was a young pilot. I can't think of the name of that one right uh, now. Val Valentich, who, who That's disappeared. Right. right. Yeah. There, there's that one. And then there's just a handful of other situations um, that I can think of where there was actually interference and a hell of, heck of a lot more sightings. Um, you know, military, I mean, uh, flight sightings than there are that there was actually interference. O'Hare was really one that should be noted as well because, you know, one of the busiest airports in the country and... Uh, uh, over gate C-17, you know, everyone's seeing the uh, the object sitting there and then shooting straight up. Um, right. And I'm surprised that more uh, people have not come forward at this point and talked about seeing that. It's still... Well, well, I, th I think one, one, one reason, Martin, is a lot of people are afraid. 
um, they they don't want they don't want people to 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 know that they've seen UFOs. They're afraid of ridicule. Ridicule is still a very big factor in the whole UFO world, and I think you know instances like 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 what you just mentioned. This this circular craft that was seen over O'Hare Airport, and then it, when it shot straight up in the air through the clouds, it left a, a circular hole through it as, as it left. And and there are other very good cases where there have been multiple eyewitnesses of UFOs during the day at night, and and people will say, well, you know, why why are so many people seeing these things, and why why are the UFOs allowing themselves to be seen? And I, my answer is. I think they want to be seen. I think that they choose instances and cases and places um, where they they know that they're being seen because how how could they not know? And and then they fly away and you know they're gone and suddenly appears on the news and becomes a, a point of discussion until the next time something like that happens. I I think that whatever the agenda is of whoever's operating the projector <laughs> of of this phenomenon, um, it knows what it's doing. It's being very clever, and people will say, "Why don't they just land on the White House lawn or in front of the Kremlin? Why should they? Why should we ask them to do something that we want them to do when it's clearly not part of of their plan, their agenda? All that we can do is just to do what you tell people to do at the end of your show: keep watching the skies. Right, right. You've actually listened all the way to the end of a show. Once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, so you also wanted to talk about a video that just came up as well, right? I, Unfortunately, I, I didn't have a time to load that on, on the that, site here. Okay. You, you, you and I have talked also about the, the many UFO pictures and videos that are that are posted all the time on YouTube that look really good. Right. You know, I, I've often said that you can take like a 9 and 10 year old boy or girl who can sit at a computer and know how to do Photoshop and they can create an astonishingly real UFO video and post it up there and claim that this was the real thing. We see that all the time. Yeah. And, and there are many sites up there uh, that claim that they're showing the best UFO footage on Earth all the time. And, and there's one that, that, that's been up there for a little while and it shows uh, it's a very intriguing looking video well because why would they put it up there if it wasn't intriguing it shows a very very clear clearly shows a large cigar shaped object um, looking uh, vertical not horizontal um, hovering and then slowly lifting up in front of mountains over Lake Michigan now I mean it's a great looking video you see the lake you see the mountains you see this thing going up into the clouds the problem, though, with this video, as with so many, is that there are no confirming details. Mm. Uh, nothing's provided. No names of witnesses. Mm. Uh, the exact location. How they happen to be at this exact location at that moment to capture this incredible, you know, miracle, uh, this amazing event on video. T too many dubious things. But the problem is, Martin, people get sucked into this. Uh, then, because they want to believe so badly that that we're being visited, we're being visited by extraterrestrials, and I don't I don't know if we're being visited by extraterrestrials. We won't even say that or offer that up as a question in our documentary. All that we know for sure is that there's something going on, and we're being visited by something. Okay, so for the uh, listener that wants to check that out, since I couldn't put it up, it's. If you go into YouTube and you actually type in huge UFO spotted in Michigan dash USA exclamation 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 April 2018 you will find that video yeah and you'll find many others too oh yeah uh, and and daily and, you know, yeah but believe believe as much as you want but <laughs> but don't believe everything you hear it's very important when I do a presentation anywhere first thing I say to an audience is please don't believe anything I'm about to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> because what do I really know other than what I've researched over a long period of time? But I'm but I'm lucky to have had a chance to interview a lot of very well placed, high official uh, people in the in the government and in the military and in science. And so I come with, to my opinion, at least with some some working knowledge of what people out there are thinking who should be involved with the process of the investigation of it. 
Yeah, well said. Lee, it's always a pleasure, and we'll, we'll have to have you. Uh, we actually talked a little while ago about having you come back on. Uh, always love having you on the show. So uh, sometime in May, uh, I'm booked out into May, and it's sometime in there. We'll look forward to having you on for a full show. Thank you. Does this mean you're going to fire Alejandro and put me on? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll have to talk about that. I, I, I'll, I'll pay you twice what I'm paying him. How's that? Oh, now we're talking the big bucks. I'm really interested now. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. All right. Thanks a lot. I'll talk to you okay. soon, Lee. Take care. Bye. All right. Okay, everyone. Uh, so that's it for uh, the news, the updates. And uh, it was great. Um, really appreciate Lee coming on and helping us out. So our guest, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Um, it's Mike Cleland. Um, he's an avid outdoorsman. He's an illustrator and a UFO researcher. Um, he's written extensively on alien abductions, synchronicities, and owls. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about, synchronicities and owls, quite a bit. And uh, I have a story that uh, I actually tried to get him involved in. We'll talk about that a little bit, too. Uh, that was when I was out in Arizona, and he wasn't. He was there the year before um, speaking. And uh, so I c actually believe I called him from Arizona and told him the story that, uh, like I said, I will bring it up. Mike? Welcome to the show again. Thank you so much. Uh, good to have you back. Uh, there's good. Mike, every, Mike is live? Yes, the mic is live. You are live. Let me, let me, let yep. me pull it down there a little bit. So. Yeah. And, you know, you we are getting... Alejandro. What's that? You fired Alejandro. <laughs> live online. Okay. <laughs> no, no. He'll be back next week. So, uh, anyway, we are having, uh, for the person that's... Uh, audio is going to be great, but we're having an annoying flashing uh, situation oh. that's happening... So we'll probably pull the audio off of you, but um, the, it'll be um, a video. So Evan, if you wouldn't mind, why don't you drop the video on uh, on the Skype side? Um, so Mike, um, for the person that did, I think it was back 2014, I believe you were on the show. Um, could you tell the uh, listening audience? I think it was that far back. A little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly when it was. It might have been after the book came out, but. Um but uh, a little bit about myself. Yes, I started doing the UFO research. And so there's no image of, on my face right now, right? There is an image of you, yes, but you're, you're not live. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I can like scratch my nose and stuff like that. So, <laughs> um, I, uh, I, from personal experiences, starting around, well, in my youth, certainly I had personal experiences with, with what sure seems like UFO contact events, missing time, um, seeing what I feel was a close-up UFO sighting, and um, and a few other very telling things. Uh, those were all sort of simmering in the background in my life. And then in 2006, I had an event, which I think we talked about the last time I was on the show. I'm sure we did. I, but I'll t say it very quick. I had an event where I saw a bunch of owls with a friend camping, three owls all at once, it was at a sort of prescient moment in the conversation, so a little synchronistic moment there in the conversation. She was talking about God, and then boom, these owls appeared. Uh, four days later, her and I went camping again. Three owls appeared at sunset, flew around us, landed near us. It was the same thing. I mean, they landed close to us. It was remarkable, and it was very... To have it happen once was pretty cool. To have it happen twice kind of freaked me out. So what it did for me is it made me start questioning this owl thing. You know, like I was looking up owl totems and I was looking up owl mythology and I was looking up owl folklore and also in conjunction with the UFO stuff. One of the things that happened, I did not talk about it at the time. It, it would have been just embarrassing at my, that point in my life. I talk about it all the time now. My life has changed enormously. Um, I said to my, I heard a voice in my head basically both times seeing those owls close up landing near us, landing on trees, swooping down right above our head for hours, it felt like. Um, I had the very clear voice in my head say, this has something to do with the UFOs. And from that point on, I just started asking folks, um, hey, do you have any, any odd owl experiences? And it's not 100% of the people, but, I'll, but um, enough that there's a pattern would say, you know, no one's ever told me that. No one's ever asked that question. Yeah, I, here, I'll tell you a story about owls. And I started collecting these stories, and I put them online, and little by little, I collected a lot of them. And then I, I 
so there came a point I was posting on my site and I wrote a little essay and I've since written two books. But at, at a certain point, this is even years ago, this was very clear. If you Googled UFOs, if you went down Google and Googled UFO owl, I was the first thing that came up. <laughs> and I was also about the next 12 things that came up under that. And so anyone, if you're in, you know, New Zealand or Finland or or New Jersey, and you see an owl and a UFO in conjunction with each other in some form, you will find me. And I have been trying to get back to everyone. It's impossible that I'm getting hit with so many people. But I have been collecting and archiving these stories, and they've been the genesis of the two book projects. The, the um, book One book came out in 2015, and the follow-up book just came out last month, a little over a month ago. So as promised, I want to just tell the story to, I have told this story before yes, yes, on the show. Do. Yes. So uh, do you do remember when I contacted you when I was out in Arizona? Yes, you did it over email, and I think we yeah. t- then we talked about it on the show, I think. I can't remember. We might have no. talked about it later. That was, uh, that was after you were on my show. Okay. Yeah, you were on my show prior to that. So basically what happened was uh, I was, uh, you know the setting over there, the beautiful uh, setting and the uh, resort. And then there's a casino. I was over at the casino walking my dog, and there was a girl outside smoking a cigarette. And she said to me, hey, what's going on over there? And I said, well, it's a UFO conference. And she goes, really? And I said, yeah. And uh, so she said, wow. She said, I should check it out. And I said, oh, you have an interest? And she goes, well, I, I had a sighting. And so I'm always excited when someone says that. So I said, please tell me about it. So basically what happened, she was she was a passenger in a car, and um, she said it was a small small car. I don't know why she told me that, but I remember her saying uh, there is significance to that. So she said she was a passenger, and they went past a, I think she called it something else, but what it really means, it's like a mesa. And they saw this big like shadow thing coming off the mesa, and up through the sunroof, they could see it was some type of craft. So her friend just said, let's get the heck out of here and stepped on it. And she said they were going, you know, really, really fast, maybe over 100 uh, for quite a while trying to outrun the thing. And uh, then she said it it just disappeared. And then she was all done with her story. And um, and then she goes, you know, the craziest thing about the whole thing. And I said, what? She goes, this huge owl just appeared after we stopped and came right down at the car. And she said it was the biggest owl I've ever saw. <laughs> and that's when I that's when I contacted you. I said, Wow, I love it because it was a a story of someone that doesn't really, you know, they're not on the inside of the UFO field in any type of way and just had no real interest in the topic and had that experience. Yeah, I remember you and I did a little bit of try to leg work trying to find her, and I wanted to hear that story directly, but we never I never got a hold of her directly. Well, I, I got her email address, but she never responded, basically. Yeah. She was just, uh, just like a lot of people are. They're afraid to talk about a situation like that. Well, then the point is that, yes, it is crazy. It's absolutely absurd that there would be an owl, but the thing is it, that that story is not uncommon. That is very common. Um, there's many ways to look at it, whether it's a screen memory, sort of some sort of projection, um, that's put into their mind, or it's a real owl. Now, for me, I almost find the real owl stories more interesting than the projections, than the than the the thought of a screen memory. That the fact that there might be a real owl that somehow shows up magically. I don't know. You know, how, why would the owl show up? I mean, this is not the realm of the UFO investigator anymore. This is almost the realm of the Native American medicine man or something like that that would know the folklore and the spirit lore of, of, of the owl and why it would be seen at such a such a prescient moment. Right, right. Um, oh, by the way, just uh, just wanted to let you know, someone emailed me or sent me a message today. Uh, Donna, I know she met you. She's down from the Cape. Um, I'll listen to the show. She's been on the show before. Uh, Donna said she... Um, she saw an owl this morning. Next thing you know, she got my email saying that you were going to be on tonight. <laughs> well, didn't that happen to you? You, that ha- you, and I you met remember in that. Yeah. Yes, you and I met in person in That's Maine right. at the Experiencer yeah. Speak Conference. And, and I had just given my, I think I was the, one of the first presenters that morning. And then um, you kind of just offhandedly say, oh, yeah, I saw an owl this morning. or heard." No, an no, owl. I got to tell you what, what happened. Uh, first of all, I had no idea who the speakers were. I had no idea who you were and that you were going to talk about owls. And that night before 
um, before that conference in Maine, I woke up to an owl right outside my window. And that's only happened, I mean, I've heard the owl around here, but he's never been that, he was right next to my uh, window that night. And next thing you know, we're talking about owls. But I I swear to God, I didn't see a UFO or had it, I didn't have any type of well, encounter. Might, who knows, who knows? That's, <laughs> that's the issue, isn't it? It's yeah. like it's, it's, there's a mystery here, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, so um, you, you felt it necessary to uh, do like a, a, an additional book because um, all these stories just kept piling in, right? Well, the premise of the first book was that I was trying to make an argument, and I'm not on camera. I could hold the book up and everything, but I can't do that now. Um, I uh, was I, I was trying to articulate. I was I, so this was the first book of its kind in a way, and I knew that going into it. So I felt like you know, like I gotta I gotta make sure I I make a forceful argument. And so the book is thick. It's all it's 400 pages long, and there was extra stuff left over. But what happened was. I, there's story after story after story documented in there, and I would I would discuss dreams, and I would dis- discuss shamanic initiation, and I sort of strayed from the core UFO thing, um, and 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 addressed a lot of other things. But it was mostly a collection of stories. There's just story after story after story in that book, and what I needed to do was edit them down, right? So I'm trying to make a point, and I'm telling three different stories. I'm comparing and contrasting the similarities of several stories in each little segment. And uh, I was left, I was left sort of heartbroken because I talked to these folks. You know, you'd have a long conversation with folks, and you talk to them about these experiences, and and they have like a there's like a huge novel like waiting to be written about a lot of people who have had these contact experiences, and it just broke my heart to say, well, this person you know was driving in their car, they saw an owl, and they saw a UFO. You know, next, and when there was so much more to the story. So the point of the second book, the follow-up book. Yeah, there's 19 there's 19 chapters each chapter reads like a short story so there's 19 separate short stories each each one where I tell these stories in the depth that I felt they need and there's a kind of um, absurd quality to some of these stories and I wanted to make sure to include all the details so I didn't have to worry about in the end I am I'm so happy that I did the second book because it broke my heart to edit out so much. So I told a bunch of stories. I felt like I told them very thoroughly and and uh, really examined the the nuances and sort of the outlying strangeness of some of these experiences. Well, um, and can you tell us um, some of the stories? I sure can. I got the book right here. Um, there's, a, there's a few that I tell consistently. Let me... Um, yeah, tell us one that you haven't told before. Yeah, there's okay, there's one that I haven't told. There's a, there's a chapter called Owls and Healing, and the woman, she's using her full name. Her name is Laura Bruno, and she is presently working as a healer. She does uh, like hands-on energy healing and Reiki and um, and intuitive healing work. And um, I know it sounds on some level, where's Lee Spiegel? He's going to chime in here. It sounds a little flaky. It sounds like it's right on that sort of more new agey edge of the, on that side of the conference room at the at the UFO conference, where, where uh, all those that, you know, but this woman is a very grounded, trustworthy person. I'm, I just, I have full trust in her story. She had an experience where she was working in the corporate world and she was gonna quit and go back to school to be a, a English professor. So she, was, she knew she was gonna go back to school. She was all ready to go back to school to get her, I think her master's degree in um, English literature. And there was a voice, she had a consistent voice in her head that said, you know, this is not your path. You need to be doing energy work. You need to be doing energy healing work. And she said, how, who, what? And so there was, she woke up one morning and she s- felt that she was basically told, you're going to get in a car accident today. And she said, okay, make it happen. And at lunchtime that day, she got into a severe car accident and oh. had a traumatic brain injury that was so bad that she lost her ability to read. Oh, she couldn't geez. read anymore. It, it, and so she um, did her convalescence at her parents' house. And she sat in the yard at her parents' house. And there was an owl that would sit with her every day. Her parents were off at work. And there was a day when her mom, who actually collected owls, and this is something, a very curious detail, that 
I have so many accounts where someone will say, yeah, I've got all these weird experiences. And, oh, yeah, my mom collected owls. We had owl knickknacks all over the house. That's not too uncommon to have owl knickknacks, but it's kind of weird how it shows up. So Laura's mother had owl knickknacks all over the house. So the owl was there as part of her healing. And her mom was there one morning and on a Saturday and a weekend and said, Laura, that's an owl in the tree. She said, yeah, it's my friend. He's here every day. I said, well, why didn't you tell me? And she was like, I, I almost didn't believe it was real. So this owl hung out, in his, and when Laura left after she got better or to enough to where she could uh, start to live on her own again, um, she, uh, you know, the owl was gone. Now, her story goes on and on and on, and there's so many strange twists and turns and life changes and and also, during the process of writing it, it really felt like I befriended her and she was going through these life issues. It took, you know, So the book project was about two years long. So I met her at the beginning of it and I finished up her story at the end of it. And it was one of those things where the story's all done and we're like, uh-oh, more stuff is going on in her life. We've got to add this new little bit here and a new little bit there. But she had these amazing experiences. And, and the, so here's a healer. She's working as a healer, which is very common, and that most of the people in the book are doing some sort of healing work, whether they're working as a Reiki therapist or whether they're working as an sh- out-and-out shaman or whether they're working as a, as a registered nurse in a, in a hospital setting. Um, so, so her story, that's, there's a lot more to it than just that, but that was the, the vibe of it, that there's this, this deeper layer that in these stories uh, that, that needs to be told more fully. Right, I see. And as far as um, oh, and show here, I'll just I'm going to get to the UFO thing. Yes, she did have UFO experiences. So she was she was she was driving with her with her. Um, uh, I, I realized I was thinking as I was like, I got to get the UFO things. Yeah. So she was driving with her. She was a young girl. She was driving to go to a swim meet with her friends, and her friend's parent was driving the car, and they were driving along. And there was this hovering silvery disc above a farmer's field, like right alongside the car. And they were, she says it was remarkable. They were all so bland. They were like, oh, that's a UFO. <laughs> Just totally bland about it, which is one of those things. You get these odd reactions. Mm-hmm. So collectively, everyone in the car had this complete blank sensation about it. It was summertime. Her arm was hanging out of the car. And for reasons she doesn't understand, there was a freak lightning bolt strike. And it struck right next to the car. She said it was six feet away from her hand, and she didn't have feeling in her hand for weeks. Wow. Now, this is the hand she now uses to do her energy work. So, uh, Wow. Bizarre, huh? Yes, very strange. Uh, and, and I have heard a number of times where people have had an encounter, and they kind of say the same thing. Like it's, uh, you know, people got bored with it. Uh, um, you know, there was a... Uh, Someone in Russia that had this sighting they, that looked like a washing machine spinning, um, and it was above the houses in this in this town, and uh, people stared at it for like hours, and everyone just kind of went inside and forgot about it. You know, what I mean, people get uh, yes, these odd reactions are are part of it. Yeah. So if you yeah. don't get those odd reactions, I'm almost a little skeptical. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what do you you said just a few minutes ago that you think it would be more interesting if they're owls, but do you th- are people actually, uh, I, I do have some questions actually, and there will be questions coming up in the chat room as well. Plus we're gonna take calls a little bit later on. But um, do people think that, you know, if they're being abducted, they see an owl too? I mean, are there experiences? I mean, there was, there was quite a bit of what you wrote on, right? Well, there's, I, you know what I did in, I, I, in the first book, I addressed the screen memory aspect. And anyone who's listening to a UFO podcast thing like this probably knows what a screen memory is. I'll try to. So what's very common, and this is something I've heard many times, someone's uh, driving down a lonely road at night. And uh, they, I'll, here's one story. This is a great story. So a guy's driving down the road at night, and I met him at a UFO uh, abductee support group. He was in there, and he, he was, everyone was, this is at the, at the Laughlin conference when it was held in Laughlin. And he was very quiet and sort of sat in the corner and didn't do anything. And finally, at the end of the, t- you know, it was like kind of a two-hour, like, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in a way. And at the end of it, he kind of timidly raises his hand and says, uh, I have a question. Has anyone in the room here ever had any odd experiences with owls? 
and he about fell out of his chair when everyone in the room, including me, raised their hand. And, and, he, and he told the story where he was driving down the road at night, and there was a big owl standing on the side of the road. So he pulls right up to it and rolls his window down, his driver's side window, and looks right at it. He's right next to it. And so he says it's four foot tall. He says he gets this really bad feeling. And he says, oh, i got to get out of here. And later he goes to take some photographs of, a, um, of an owl's nest. So he, uh, he, he realizes, looking at these real owls, that that wasn't an owl I saw that night on the side of the road. And he went through hypnotic regression, and the only thing that came up in hypnosis was that the owl was wearing boots. Yeah. So, so the implication is now what is very common, and, and I've you know read the transcript and actually listened to recordings where the hypnotherapist will say, you know, to someone like, "Well, describe the owl that's in the road," and the person will say, "Well, the owl has big black eyes. It's bald. It's got a little skinny body. It's got a shiny uniform on," and they're describing the sort of prototypical gray alien in the road rather than the owl. They remember an owl. They have the perception of seeing an owl. So somehow there's a projection into the mind of the observer. I don't understand how it happens or why it happens, but that is very common. It's not always owls. It's deer and raccoons and clowns show up a lot. Uh, so these, but the owl seems to be the, the far and away in the lead as far as the one that's the most reported. So that Almost. would be the screen memory. So mm-hmm. that would so there, there's the implication that there's a hidden abduction event, and that's unremembered, some sort of amnesia. The same way they have the psychic power to to zap the observer and make them see an owl, they can somehow create an amnesia environment where the the person simply doesn't remember it. They get home and like, why am I home two hours late? That doesn't make any sense at all. The implication is that something else happened at the hands of these UFO occupants. Um, and honestly, that's the part that I I kind of brushed over. That there's the big thick book there's no people inside the craft for the most part no memories of being on a table and things like that that show up in either of these books i was much more interested in the lives of these people and the the sort of very human experiences that 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 they were confronted with um now the stranger thing would be the real owl right like that's very common i mean people take pictures of them i get them all the time like you know like oh i had this you know contact experience and I you know like I was I came home and there was an owl that just started living on my porch or that was living in my garage and I get a lot of pictures of people who you know claim tell me very tell me their contact experiences and then they follow up by sending here's a picture I took I was like four feet away from this owl and it's a big owl right on the back porch and they walked right up to it and took its picture in the dark so weird wow it's very strange. Yes, yeah, so I don't know quite what to make of it. Yeah, so owls showing up, that's on the simplest level. Owls showing up at the home of someone who's having contact events is, in my opinion, normal. I mean, it's obviously not 100% of the people who have these experiences, but it's enough that there's a very strange side of this. Um, now, we had uh, uh, some questions come in from a Carrie, who often sends questions to different um, guests we have. Do you know if there are different types of animals being reported coinciding with UFO interactions depending on what parts of the world? You know, I can't say depending on what parts of the world. I suspect that you wouldn't see penguins in, you know, the <laughs> Sudan, but uh, but uh, there's certainly a lot of animals, yes. Owls, deer are the first two animals on the list. Then raccoons and cats and squirrels actually show up a lot. People say, yeah, I saw a four-foot-tall squirrel looking in my window. That's that's not unusual. Um, so... I do and remember the ap- thing about the deer. I've heard people talk about deer before. Deer is very common, yeah. So deer is yeah. also very... So both owls and deer are both very mythic animals. They show up in folklore. They show up in mythology. So, you know, I, if you pull on that thread, right? Like, what does it really mean? What's the spirit animal? of? What's the spirit meaning of a deer? What's the spirit meaning of an owl? You pull on that thread, it's... It's fruitful, right? It's like as an investigator, as a, as someone who's really like for myself, I'm like invested in trying to look at this from as many angles as I can possibly try to look at it. This has been exciting and fun work to 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 go down those avenues where I don't think a MUFON investigator would look up the, you know, spirit lore of the deer if someone said they saw a deer in the road just before a, a UFO. Fox actually show up too. Uh, wow. So do you actually? Um do you actually uh, talk with people from different countries as well that have the same well, they, experience? 
they have to speak English before I can talk to them. So like, that limits me a little bit. But yeah. yes, I've talked to many, many people. A lot of the correspondence is over email, but I certainly talk on the phone and talk on Skype a lot with folks. Yeah. So yeah, Canada for sure. And I've talked to people, a lot of people in England and Finland, um, Germany, when, uh, Brazil. When people contact you, are they looking to resolve? Uh, uh, you know, what? what's the reason they contact you? Uh, to begin with, to tell their story and feel better about it, or, or get I think information, a little of both, a little all of that, yeah, a mix of all of that. You know, I think, and this is something I, so. He, the first book, was my therapy, right? So that was my therapy session. It was a three-year therapy session. I would sit at the typewriter and and go through my own personal therapy. That was I was retelling my own set of experiences within that first book, and at the end of it. It was successful. I came out the other end of that book a much calmer person, hmm. much more grounded, calmer person. I'm drinking a little coffee right now. You might not, you might, I might not sound calmer and grounded, but, uh, and so the second book, I was really, really talking with folks in depth. And what happened was I heard my voice in these folks. I heard the person I was a few years ago. I, I was talking to people who were very tense and very confused about their experiences. Uh, you know, basically what I found at the end of the first book, as far as my own journey in a way, was I'm never going to find a true answer. I have to be comfortable with just, you know, the questions that arise. And so I got to hear my own emotions mirrored back to me in, in talking to these other folks. And I feel like I played a role, I want to cautiously say that with some of the folks, I feel like I helped with some solace in their lives. Now, your question was, um, I'm gonna have to replay the tape. <laughs> oh no no! no I'll, 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 but so your question was was um uh oh the people who um are having these experiences you know why why are they contacting me what's the yeah. and so yes it's, it's partially I think people just need to tell their story so here's someone so I'm the guy who collects owl stories so when they say um listen I had an owl story I had an owl event it took place like this like this like this and I can say. That's very interesting because it's not exactly the same story I've heard, but it has the same flavor. And here's these other stories, and I can direct them to other stories that are similar. And um, and it's it's a relief for them, I think, to 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 realize that they're not alone. We have uh, someone in the chat room that said they have a story to tell. So hopefully that person will hang in there, and uh, in just a little while we'll take calls, and uh, they can call in. Uh, so if anyone is listening live right now and has an owl story and you want to talk about it, feel free to call in. I uh, will put that number up in a little bit. Also, um, if you need to contact Mike um, at a later time, I have your information here on how to contact you. You have two different websites. Uh, one is hiddenexperience.blogspot.com and then Correct. simplyyourname.com, Mike Clellan. Um, and that second one is is a is sort of a promotion thing for the book, and it then leads you to the it's got it's got links to the blog, so yeah. So someone is bound to messages on it uh, between YouTube and my podcast. Someone's bound to hear this that have an owl experience, and you encur you're basically encouraging them to contact oh, yes. you. Oh yes, and right up in big letters at the top of my blog, I say I want to hear your owl stories. I I apologize, I might not be able to get back to people right away, but I do my best effort to get back to everyone. And I fail sometimes. So it's, and this is, the, I make a joke in a way where people say like, well, how do you know this owl stuff is real? You know, like, and I'm like, you know how I know it's real? Look at my email inbox. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like nobody's making this stuff up. Like nobody could make this, like they're, yeah, it's just too much. Basically, I'm getting one good story a day. Probably, oh let's say goodness. most days of the week, I'm getting a good story. Most days of the week. So do the math. Wow, wow. 300, 300 excellent stories a year, and I've been doing this for eight years. Maybe a good idea would be to open a, a chat board or, a, you know, like a forum. Have everyone oh, just post idea. their, yeah, have everyone post their stories and just copy and paste, make your next book. <laughs> I'm joking, sort more, of. Yeah. A little more sweat into it than just cut and paste, <laughs> but yes. Yeah, yeah do a little editing. But uh, So uh, let's hear, uh, I'd love to hear these stories um, Let's let's uh, you you say in the second book here you talked in great depth. Um, is there anything you can share um, that 
came out in some of these conversations? Well, there's a whole book of it, yeah. I mean, so I can tell another story from yeah. the second book if you want. Sure. Um, there's a woman named Brenda, and she had an experience. She contacted me. It's very interesting. She contacted me, I think, in 2011. We had a wonderful conversation, and she told me the story. And then she, then I contacted her again under very synchronous circumstances where she found out that the, that that um, the book had been published, the the, um, the, the uh, first book, and got a hold of me. And I had actually included a small snippet of her story, which I, which I was very, I, fr I just kind of, in, in a single sentence, I told an event. So she had an experience. She's, uh, it's Halloween night. She gets in an argument with her boyfriend at the time. She uh, decides she's going to go to her sister's house. And she said, I'm just going to walk to my sister's house middle of the night, it's after midnight. Her sister lives 12 miles away. Huh. I'm like, why did you walk to your sister? Did you think, she said, There's, I have no idea why I just started walking to my sister's house. This guy pulls up in a car. She described him as a big Scottish guy with a great big red beard, a great big guy with red hair and a red beard. And he said, get in the car, I'll take you out. Well, and she was like, and she said, it is totally unlike me to get in the car. I would never do that. So she never would walk to her sister's house. She would never get in a person's car. She just dropped off at her sister's house. Her sister isn't home. So she sits on the back porch, and then she eventually gets in. And that night, all these weird things happen. There's lights in the room. There's she, she's So it's a very disturbing night for her. She wakes up the next morning, and she's sort of looking at the what she thinks is the sun setting. And then the phone rings, and boom, it's full daylight. So there's these odd details of that night, including the strange thing. So she gets up, and there's a great big owl. She says it's the size of a small child in a tree outside the big sliding glass door in, in the back of the house. You know, the big full-size glass window and um, the glass door window. And there's an owl there. And she says that it's drooping down. The big branch that the owl is on is drooping down really low. The owl is so heavy. Hmm. And her and her sister look And owls at it weigh and nothing, by the way. They weigh very little, surprisingly. Yes. Yeah, they have hollow bones. And I took care of a great horned owl um, many years ago that was wounded. And I remember That's the thing. I've never held an owl. That's everyone who holds an owl says the same thing. Yeah, very light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that I would took that into account when she said it was making the the branch droop. Hmm. So she, she watches this owl, and then eventually it flies off. So she has a UFO contact event. She wakes up. She first thing she sees in the morning when she gets out of bed is this owl, and it sits there for the rest of the afternoon. She has a bunch of other experiences that are just amazing. A handful of UFO sightings, which I chronicle. That are all very interesting, though they sound very typical to the kind of things that you would hear in a MUFON report, let's say. So, but I, I chronicled those and very. Um, now, pardon me, just I'm sorry for the interruption, but are you saying that she had these sightings like before or after? Well, some before and some after, yeah. Oh, okay, uh huh. Go ahead. So, um, she had an amazing story. So she was worked at these Renaissance festival things and she basically said she ran away with the gypsies and started working the circuit of the renaissance festivals where she would be in a costume and they would uh um she was at the time she was partners with a musician so they were uh traveling these fairs so they're at a house and and in texas during some downtime and it's a friend of a friend and everyone in the rena the renaissance circle is kind of like yo just stay at my house so there's this kind of everyone has a place to stay when you work in these things so they're staying at a friend's house and um the uh, they're all sitting around the house, and the, the one of the fellows that that was there, friend of a friend kind of thing, walks into the room and he's carrying a sword. And I interrupt him like, "Wait, where do you, where do you get a sword?" And she goes kind of like, "Well, when you work Renaissance festivals, <laughs> that's you, there's swords around." Yeah. So, okay, fair enough. And he was very shy and very soft spoken and very introverted. And he stood in the middle of the room and spoke. She said it was like James Earl Jones reciting Shakespeare. <laughs> he spoke in like, and now the story of the white buffalo. And he told this long, complicated, mythic story of the of the white buffalo and how there's these issues where mankind is in jeopardy and the white buffalo has to be attended to. And, and it just it, and it was almost like nonsensical. And then at the end. Well, during the talk, this the, the someone in the house was watching the football game. So he's standing in the middle of the room with his sword, making this weird speech with a voice that wasn't his. She looks at the television set, 
and it's and it's them on the television. It's like live feed in the room on the television. She looks at the television. It's 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 them in the room. Hmm. And and he finishes his story and he sets the sword down, and everyone in the room is quiet. No one says anything. And then someone says, well, I'm going to go to bed. Me too. And they all get up and go to bed. And then the next morning, she gets up and says, what was that story about the white buffalo? What were you guys talking about? And they were like, I don't remember. What story? What, what, we didn't say anything about the white buffalo. They, to the fellow, he's like, I didn't say anything about a white buffalo. What are, you ta- what are you talking about? And then there's a knock at the door. And it's the and she's, it was the Jehovah's Witnesses. She didn't actually <laughs> talk to them. The, her boyfriend did. And they were like, hi, can we come in? And they're like, um, no, it's not my house. I can't let you in. Um, well, can we talk to you? We just want to talk to you. And she said, uh, well, no, we can't talk to you. And we, I mean, we, we can't let you in. And she said, well, the real reason we're here is because someone saw a UFO hovering above your house last night. And we wanted to talk to you about it. And yeah. the one guy, had no, he didn't remember the White Buffalo story. So he just basically slammed the door in, her, in their face. And, the, and Brenda was all kind of like, like, what is going on? So these are the these are the types of events that are completely on one level absurd, mm-hmm. but that's what's arising out of these stories. So um, Ann Streber, the wife of um, the late wife of Whitley Streber, she had a what she called her BS meter. Like she could mm-hmm. tell if a story someone was telling the truth, and she said if it, if they tell me a story, and it's not weird, I don't trust it. Uh-huh. So I was just like, you know, like this. I go pretty far out on a limb with some of the accounts that show up in this book, but I felt I needed to because that's what these people were earnestly trying to tell me. And when Brenda told me this story, um, she told it to me twice, once in 2011 and once during the production of the book. Um, it was the same story, so I have full confidence in what she shared. You know, it's funny. I had a... God, I can't remember who it was. It might have been Dean Eliotto. Um It was someone I had on my show recently, and they were talking about a uh, UFO report, and I'm getting the name wrong, I think, talking about a UFO report, and they said that the MUFON investigator just skipped right over a part because he thought it was silly and didn't mean anything, and it it was like a bunny rabbit on the porch with an, and dressed in plaid, like, where did that come from? All of a sudden, that, that was just showed up there, and he said, now, wait a minute, that is the part of the story you got to pay <laughs> attention to. <laughs> So it yeah, kind of goes along the same line. You know, the weirder it gets, it's like, you know, there are some really weird accounts of uh, that absolutely make no sense at all. And I think some of those are some of the more interesting ones. Well, that's the book is full of those. That's what I was going for because I felt bad that I had to, to, to weed out these these accounts. And there's this there's this kind of strange loopy logic on how these all fit together you know the synchronistic strangeness to some of these things how they how these stories all co-join yeah i'd like to like to hear some more uh there's another question that came in have any abductees you've interviewed stated that visions of owls changed to actual visions of ets at one time that is one i can answer yes there's a wonderful (laughs) friend of mine her name is lucretia hart that's a pen name she she has a wonderful blog called At Spiral's End. Anyone listening right now, get on that blog. You'll, it's, it's 10 novels of her experiences all stacked up in this, in this site. So I had a long conversation with her. She told me the, this amazing owl story. She was 19 years old. I think she's in her 40s now. She was 19 years old at the time. She was working at a summer camp for girls in the Pacific Northwest. And she wasn't like out in the deep in the woods. She was like between two cabins and there was a little trail and she kind of walked through a meadow and she was kind of off on her own for a little bit before she got to the other cabins and um, full daylight. And she knew she'd been having contact experiences, but they always happened at night. She never had anything strange happen during the day. So she's walking between these two cabins and, and in this little meadow and she turns a corner and there next to the trail is a gray alien standing there full daylight. She looks at the gray alien. It looks at her, and she 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 catches it. It's like there's this kind of like oh crap moment, like like I'm busted, and she she senses that, and then she hears like a sort of telepathic reverberation where this thing sends out like an energy wave that goes owl 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 owl, and the next thing she knows, she's looking at a four foot tall owl, hmm. and this this big owl turns and runs off into the woods. Now she actually said that it ran off into the woods and. And um, they don't run. Of, 
<laughs> it kind of hovered. It kind of like floated huh. over the grass in a way. And she she went in back and there was a big ditch that if it was actually running, it would have had to drop down in the ditch and come up the other side. But that's not what she saw. She saw it kind of hover in a in a motion across the across the the um the field there. So yes, there's and I have another experience where someone uh or another witness account where someone uh saw a bright flash. They'd been having UFO contact experiences at their home. They saw a bright flash out in the front yard and they walked out onto the front porch and they were like, you know, what's going on? And they looked out, there was nothing out there. And then they looked to the side and right next to the porch, kind of near the house, were four gray aliens, four skinny gray aliens. And they were looking at her. And then, poof, they just instantly turned into four deer. And she said they walked backwards, <laughs> really eerie, like they didn't, they they were had their eyes locked on her and they walked backwards these four deer, so yeah there's a couple of there's several accounts where people watch these these uh, where like like the uh, the psychic mojo didn't work quite right and they they got kind of mess, messed up so <laughs> they got busted so to speak yeah. uh, just to let the um, live listener know live listener know we're going to uh, we could take calls actually. Starting now, if you want to share, if you have had it in Owl Store, we'd really, really love to hear from you. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to call in. The number's up on your screen right now on the YouTube screen. Um, we'd love, uh, first of all, if you do have an Owl Store, please do call in. Mark, I saw you uh, on the message board. If you're still there, please call in. Let's hear the story. If, um, if you don't have a story and you just want to ask our guest a question, Again, that number is right up on the screen right now on YouTube. So down on the left, I mean down on the right-hand side. Um, so also, I just wanted to let you know that I am getting um, some questions coming in in the chat. But if you're listening live right now, I'm not always able to check that. I do have someone that will look at it and possibly send some of your questions forward. Um, someone wants to know what advice you would give someone if they started noticing owls on a frequent basis that defies a rational explanation. Well, I am the one person to ask, uh, <laughs> because that's exactly what happened to me. Starting in about 2006, between about 2011, it was off the charts. So, if uh, it defies rational, yes. So, my, my answer is, you know, I really don't know. The best thing I can say is, uh, what's going on in your life? What is some, I've, so here I'm taking, I'm not acting as a UFO investigator. I've taken my UFO investigator hat off and I'm pushing it aside and that's not my concern right now. My, I'm putting my shaman hat on. I'm not a shaman, but it's kind of like my, so I would say, you know, what is going on in your life? What is going on in your life that would, that would manifest these owls? And usually there's some form of stress. There's some form of life change. There's some form of, of life mission or urgency that's associated with these kinds of sightings and, and, and to take that seriously, like, you know, really do some deep internal work, um, that's one answer. The other answer would be there may, you know, is this someone, I guess you can't ask because, you know, my question would, the, the question that comes up in my mind is, have you had UFO contact? I mean, that's a tough question for someone to answer. So, Right, right. Um, someone wants to know in the chat, um, can you just call out one more time the name of your blog, please? Yes, my blog is hiddenexperience.blogspot.com. Um, you can Google UFOs, owls, and I will come right up. You will have no problem finding me. So I think that's maybe how I found you the first time uh, when I had you on the show. Or no, actually, we exchanged information. I, we exchanged business cards, I think, yeah. That's right, that's right. Um, and it seems, it sounds to me almost like this, you, you said the first uh, book you did was kind of like a therapy Um do you still see owls? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I also live in a place with a lot of owls, so it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I mean, they're know, not a rare, like, rare bird of any kind. But you know, I mean, no, there's it's lots just, of owls out there. It's just when they show up is the, the strange well, part. Well, if they show up at prescient moments, and that's a that's a perfect word for it. Do they show up at like you know mystically important moments? You know, highly charged moments. Then well, I pay attention. They're nocturnal, first of all. For, for the, you know, it, it, they are seen in the daytime. You know, I think it's a barn owl or I can't remember the which one. The bigger the owl, the bigger the owl, the more likely they are to be seen during the day. Yeah. Yeah, but um, but it's not like they're, you know, they're most 
mostly nocturnal, but they do occasionally show up in the day. I mean, I've seen them in the day a few times. And, and many times and, I have too. Yeah, and, so I still see them, and I, it's really funny because as soon as I see them, like the little bells are ringing in my head, like, what's what's going on in my life? What is it? Is this an important <laughs> one? Is this a not so important one? Um, you know, we get them in the yard and we hear them, and and I'm all I love owls, so I'm all about like getting out there and get trying to get a closer look, and and um, so yeah, so but yes, I. There's, I see, still see a lot of owls. And the, one of the things I have to do is sort of turn my filter down. I mean, you can walk down the main street of any town and you can go one city block and you're going to count five or 10 owls. There's going to be little owl lunch boxes. You're going to look in a oh. window and there's going to be a calendar with owls on it. Someone's going to have a little stuffed owl on their desk. So <laughs> if you're looking for owls, they're out there. So just be careful because it can, yeah, you know, sometimes, a, sometimes an owl is just an owl. Um, you know, and someone had posted in the uh, chat room about, their relative collected owl figurines and I'm I'm an a fine arts appraiser and a state appraiser and you know I've seen anything from bulldogs to penguins I've seen penguins elephants is another common one um, and people collect in mass cows sometimes they collect um, you never know loons in Maine everyone collects loons for some reason but uh, huge collections um, and it really doesn't mean anything no, it doesn't mean anything, but it is, it's something I pay attention to when someone says, oh, my mother collected owls, you know, and then I had this strange owl experience, like, like Laura Bruno's mom. I, I, ta I put that in the, you know, it's a, it's a tiny clue, you know, like I don't weight it too much, but it's there. It's a clue. So Mark, if you're listening, we'd love to hear from you again, the numbers up on the screen. Um, hopefully you'll call in and tell us your story. As you mentioned, you, ha you have one to tell. Um, this is kind of a, a sort of a fringe question. This person is 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 uh, stating it as that. Do you think it's possible that owls are being controlled somehow by ETs in order to monitor abductees? This is a great question. I so I I, the, I have no idea. But if you were going to pick one animal on Earth to monitor abductees, and you had the the power of the UFO occupant, right? And then their their psychic powers, their mechanical powers, their technological powers, the owl would be the one perfect thing, right? They're they can fly in complete darkness. They have stealth flying abilities. They don't make any sound when they fly. They have perfect night vision. They have the best hearing of any animal in like North America. Uh, any bird, especially. So owls are like best night vision, best hearing, best silent flight. And then if you do see one out your window, it's not that, uh, you know, it's like it's not like seeing a gray alien out your window. Let me put it that way. So, yes. So if they wanted to pick an, an animal to sit by your window, right? So if there was an owl out my window right now, it could hear every word I'm saying, right? So it's got, it's, it's through the glass. It's got, it's hearing is plenty good to hear every word I'm saying here. Um, so they, I, that is a wonderful avenue of, of, of research or thought, let's say, to, to go down that road because they are the perfect, you know, uh, what would you call it, like organic stealth drone. <laughs> yeah, and your vision, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that I took care of a, an owl. And uh, I remember it saw, you know, it was awake during the daytime when I was taking care of it. And I kept seeing it like move its head around like this and like that. And um, it was actually seeing a spider move across the room up on a spider web. That's how good the vision this thing has. Uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then at night, they could do it too. I, I cover a little bit of it. I do some uh, people, uh, some people like this chapter and some people thought it was like, When's, when do we get back to the UFOs? Where I did a chapter in the first book on just the physiology of owls. I tried to write a very. You know, kind of. I just needed to address how interesting the bird is on its in its own right. It's night vision, and I and that. So, how so, it, uh, you know, you say you get one good story a day, which totally is a mind blower to me. I mean, I I can't believe that. Most days, most days, I'm exaggerating only slightly when I say <laughs> one a day. Um, but are these all these stories in particular just owl stories, or or most of them have to do with a UFO sighting and an owl? Most of them have to do with a UFO sighting in an owl or a UFO contact or some sort of, you know, sometimes it might be like aliens in the room. They don't see a UFO, but they see, you know, they get <laughs> some pretty strong clues. You know, the portal opens up in their bedroom and, you know, and there's, you know, they hear owls hooting and then a, like a vortex portal opens up in their bedroom. I've That one shows up too. So, uh, so yes, 
Yeah. So the 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 ones that I'm interested in, and they they I'm I'm asking for them. So like I am not a what would you call it? I'm not a uh, uh, an objective researcher. I am sub- absurdly subjective. You know, like I'm I'm pushing all the data out of the way, and the only thing I want to latch my little <laughs> talons into is the owl stuff. <laughs> and what has happened is is I'm seeing this tiny, right? So like a like there's a you know if you put all the there's a lot in a UFO realm right there's i mean there's been thousands of books and and there's mm-hmm. every way to look at it from nuts and bolts to spiritual to ancient aliens and but the owl thing is this little small part of this big massive mess of a drama and what i'm finding is you pull on that one small thread i'm taking the tiniest corner of the of the the most fringy little fractal of this big overall picture and pulling on it. And what I'm finding is that there's just a wealth, an absurd wealth of, of exactly the kind of story that kind of floats my boat. You know, these, these amazing, weird, illogical kind of, kind of, kind of, uh, Zen Cohen's of experiences. I don't, uh, I can't think of any other topic in the UFO field that, that, that compares to, can you? As far as as far as uh, you know, another thread that someone could pull. Sure, what's Kenneth Ring pulled the uh, the uh, near death experience? You know, he compared and contrasted the near death experience to the UFO contact experience. Um, I haven't heard uh, that. John Mack and a few other authors. John Mack wrote the book uh, Passport to the Cosmos, where he compared shamanic initiation to the UFO contact experience. Okay, so you're, those, yeah, those so there are topics. There, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could come up with a few more, but that was pretty good right off the top of my head. Not too bad. Hey, um, someone wanted to know, could you please repeat the blog you mentioned earlier? There was a woman you said you, it's a must-read blog. Yes. Could you at repeat that, please? Spiral's End. Say that so, one. Uh, at Spiral's End. At uh, Spiral's End. Yes. So I'll make spiral's a note to put that in the uh, show notes as well. Yeah. Pretty sure that's the name of it. I could look it up here. Maybe I should look it up because it's, sometimes it's the title is. Okay. Um, so let's... Uh, I'm kind of disappointed, Mark. Hopefully you'll call in. Uh, Anyone else, if anyone's had an OWL experience, uh, please do call in. Or if uh, you just want to ask our guest a question, uh, that number is up on the line. If you happen to be listening, I'm going to repeat the number. Just I'm going to say the number one time, but please uh, keep in mind it's a live show only. So if you're listening to this as a podcast or you're listening um, on another radio station, it's only during the live show that this phone number actually works. And that's 603-967-4030 if anyone wants to call in. And even if you're a skeptic, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And I know this is a sort of an unusual topic. Uh, he has just mentioned that he's not interested in any... <laughs> You just want the owl data. That's all you want. You don't want. No, anything. no, I'm joking. Yeah. I was being yeah. purposely provocative. I'm. I've got a pretty broad. You know, I'm very interested in the topic. You know, so. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Let's hear another story. I, I love these stories. I mean, they, they're really, really fascinating. And you can actually, uh, you know, you don't have to. They don't all have to be from the latest book. Um, just if you can think of like. Uh, yeah. So here's one. Here's one. And this has happened after the event in Maine. Um, and it, oh. I can't remember the year. I would have to think of it. But it might have been right after I spoke with you because I I spoke at the conference. Mm-hmm. And um, there was a uh, so I gave an owl talk at the conference and and there was a lot of owl buzz and people were coming up to me with their owl stories. I heard a lot of owl stories. And everyone after the conference, like a core group of folks, friends, and and uh, all went up to a lake house. That um, Audrey's mother, oh yeah, Audrey Starborn, who was running the conference, her mother had a lake house. It was about an hour north of Portland, and, and talk about the, you know, it's like loons. It was the place with loons, <laughs> so kind of thing. So they, uh, and they were all hanging out, and there was so there was there was people were like, let's manifest, let's do a little uh, manifestation, let's get it, let's get a UFO to come. So everyone went down to. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, we have a call that came in, but go ahead. I just want to let you know we have okay. a call. Yeah, great. I'll, I'll finish this up quick. So they um, they did a little manifestation. I was down there at the river, and actually I got a little uncomfortable. It was so, like, the energy was so amped up. 
Wow. And everyone was like, yeah, they're going to appear right there. And everyone's, every, not everyone, but, you know, so you're basically dealing with a bunch of abductees all in the middle of the night, full moon by the lake, and they're on this little beach, and they're pointing to the sky, and like, it's going to come right there. It's going to be there. It's going to be there. And I remember like, <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> I got to get out of here. And then I just walked away, and then everyone went, whoa! And you hear this big collective, like, wow! And then they, they, I ran back down there, and what happened? What happened? And I said, well, there was this big flash right where we were all pointing. And, they, and I was like, I gave them a lot of credit because they were down there for an hour and it was cold. It was like September and it was down by the lake and it's mm-hmm. real far north and it's cold. So later, two women, Carol and Pam, went back down to the lake just to hang out. And they were talking and they're both experiencers and they're very close friends and they've shared everything with each other. So they're, they just get down there and then they, it was about two o'clock in the morning when they get down there and they're, you know, and then they look at the clock and it's like, it's 4.30. Like, there's no way it's 4.30. How did it get to be 4.30? We lost two and a half hours. How did it get to be 4.30? And they're like, and I, and my sense is like, there is no way you could like fall asleep in that spot because it was cold and clammy and you're down by the water and it would have been chilly. It was kind of bone chilling. Hmm. And they were just sitting there all of a sudden two and a half hours are gone and they are freaked out. And they walk back up and everyone was spending the night in these tents. So, there's this lawn and it's packed with all these tents. So they go to their tent and the sun's coming up, just barely starting to come up at this point. So they climb in their tent and Carol says, this owl talk had been going on all day. And they said, let's ask, let's ask an owl if something really did happen tonight. And right at that moment, hoo, 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 this owl calls <laughs> and they're freaked out. And then the next thing they know, it happens again. Hoo, 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 it's a, and it's close. And then, that, then the third time it happens, it is loud. It is right over their tent, and it's like knocking sticks and branches down on their tent. Jeez. <laughs> so this happened. This happened. Here's this, so right next to the tent was a fellow named Jack who saw an owl earlier that day with his partner, Suzanne. Now, Jack and I, I've known Jack for a while, and we sat and talked, and he was drinking a beer, and it was a total, like, picnic on the lake and he just was sitting in his lounge chair and he says i am turning into my dad i'm (laughs) turning into my dad i just feel my dad's presence here right now and he was all happy about it and he's like oh god i'm at that age where i just realize i just look in the mirror and i see my dad and he was basically saying like i feel my dad's his dad had just died not too much earlier so so and we're in the so the owl so jack is in the next tent so he has sticks banging down in his tent in this loud hooting, and he grabs his phone and looks at the time. It's 4.20 a.m. His dad died on April 20th. Hmm. So he had an immediate synchronistic confirmation right away, knew it in his bones. That was the day my dad died. Oh. An owl is the totem of death in many cultures. It is, it is, it's not a bad totem, but it's associated with death. The oh. tent right next to him they ask, did we really have UFO contact tonight? Bam! Instantly they get an answer from an owl. Two tents side by side. One has the totem lore of the UFO abduction experience. The tent right next to him has the totem lore of death. Both people got direct confirmation. In their, I mean, their, for them, they got direct confirmation. Hmm. He, Jack was like, this is a sign from my dad. Wow. The two in the tent were like, this is a sign from the aliens. <laughs> same branch, same owl, same sticks. Wow, that was quite a coincidence, huh? All happening after you left? No, I was asleep at that point, but <laughs> I didn't hear the owl. I got up the next morning and everyone was like, Mike, you're the owl guy. Uh, we got a, we got a, here we got a story for you. So, <laughs> uh, We have a caller on the line. Uh, thanks so much for uh, being patient and hanging in there. Your first name and where are you calling from, caller? This is Mark. Hi, Mark. How are you? Where are you calling from? Uh, Lafayette, California. Oh, I know right where that is. You do, I know. Yeah, we used to live out that way. That, yeah. That left guy just stole my thunder. Is oh, this is this is Mark, the Mark I know. Yeah, the oh. Mark you know. Yeah, oh, hey, how are you? Mark is a great musician. As a matter of fact, um, the show that I was playing, the live stream show, I would play his music on it, and everyone would say, who, who, who did that music? That's really beautiful. Uh, Mark's a wonderful musician. Uh, thanks for calling, Mark. I'm glad you glad you called in. So uh, that's okay. Uh, we still want to hear your story. Well, it was funny. My best friend since first grade, uh, his dad 
uh, we, I was close to their family. I almost lived in their house. And we, his dad had, had died after I'd spent time with them both. And we were sitting, he had this kind of lower level to their, his parents' house. And we were sitting in this lower level. There were a lot of trees around in a creek that ran by this, this level down, uh, big kind of a lawn area. And my daughter and I, she, my daughter was about nine years old. We went down. It was dark. It was nighttime. We would sat down and we were kind of reminiscing. His dad had just died. And, you know, we were feeling kind of sad and just talking about his dad. And just said my dad loved owls. And and, um, and my daughter did, too. She was an owl freak. And within a minute, this owl swooped down over our head within, I mean, I'm not kidding, 10 feet. And landed in this branch on this tree and just sat there and looked at us while we were talking. Wow. And he just looked up and said, hi, Dad. I mean, I know it sounds <laughs> contrived, but I mean, I swear to God that happened. I mean, it was just the weirdest. It, it, it actually scared my daughter. She wanted to leave um, <laughs> after that happened because it was just so bizarre that we were talking about these owls and this thing within a minute or whatever swoops down over our heads almost touching it. You could hear the wings flapping as it went up into this branch near us and just sat there. Anyway. Wow. That was my story, but it was the same sort of thing with this guy just had, sort of, it sounds like. Well, what you've just described is absolutely common. I have collected so many accounts of, and not just owls. Owls seem to be, um, they're sort of arriving because I'm asking for them, but I have other birds too. But owls, um, where people, especially a parent, an owl will show up shortly after the death of a parent, and the and the people will talk to the owl as if it's their mother or father. This is yeah. extremely common. Um, I have goosebumps right now as I'm talking, listening to this. Yeah. So here, um, I was, so so I'll tell a story that this happened to me. I've never told this one. It's in the book, and I just am cautious to tell it on a podcast. But so. Um, in 2012, my mom died. It was She had been suffering with a terrible illness for years and years and years, and she was in her 80s, and it was a blessing that she passed. I was sitting and holding her hand, and my sister was on the other side of the bed holding her other hand, and my brother was just happened to be out of the hospital room at the time. But So the family was there. She passed. I was in the middle of this owl research. This is 2012. It's just starting. I would sit with my, I was there for, for a few weeks with my sister, and I would sit every morning, we would drink coffee leading up to this, and I would open my email, and I would read an owl story. And she, you could see my sister getting uncomfortable. I'm like, Jeannie, this happens every day. I get a story like this every day. And I would read these weird stories about owls. And so that happened at like three in the morning and the next day it was just like we were trying to sleep and trying to deal with arrangements and it was my brother sister and i and we're all adults and we're all and my both my brother and sister are a little they i can i know they don't they don't quite follow what i'm doing in the in and and i that night we were sitting on the deck and my sister lives in north carolina it was in the south and it was on this you know just a neighborhood but it was warm and we're drinking a glass of wine in this couch on the back deck, and all of all three of us are exhausted. And Jeannie's best friend, my sister's best friend, is named Ruthie. She is sitting across from us. And leading up to this, I was thinking, like, I know there's going to be some owl synchronicity. Something with an owl is going to show up. And Ruthie kind of says to all three of us, so we're all sitting three on a couch, and Ruthie is sitting directly across from us. I'm sitting in the middle. My brother's on one side, my sister's on the other. And she says, she's very proper, very Southern, she says, I have a story to tell. I know there is an afterlife. I know that there is an afterlife, and that is good. And I know because of an experience I had with an owl. And right at that moment, my brother and sister just flinch. You could see them like they, they just like, my sister literally did the thing where she put her hands over the ears. Like, no, 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 no. Like, 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 I don't want to hear this. And, and you could see the look on Ruthie's face. Like, what did I just say? And I was, I had to interrupt. Like, Ruthie, my brother and sister are, have heard it from me, but I'm doing owl research in how it's associated with paranormal events. And one of the things it's associated with is with death. And I want to hear your story. And she says, okay, her daddy, died. her dad died. She called him daddy. Her dad died. And she said, she's very proper, very Southern. 
she was very soft spoken. She said, I was grieving. I would walk this trail, this nature trail. There's a little nature trail around the neighborhood. I would walk this nature trail every day as part of my grieving process to come to terms with my father's death. And every day there was an owl on a branch. And I always thought it was so strange because owls really don't come out in the day. And then finally, there was a point when she stopped in front of this owl. And she said, Daddy, is that you? And she locked eyes with this owl. And she had the transcendent moment of the grief evaporating. Mm. And the owl flew off. She never saw the owl again, and she worked through her grieving process. She talked to the owl as if it was her father for a few minutes there. So that happened. That was my, that was, that I'm convinced, whatever the grand architects of reality put that story in place at that moment. So I was sitting there on the couch with my brother and sister, and we all could hear that story from someone they trusted and, and so that was a powerful, beautiful experience. Ruthie treats the experience as something absolutely beautiful, like a gift from God, that owl. And so that is the power of the mythic power of the owl. And, and it's, it's not an ancient archetype. It's not an ancient fable that's way off in the distance. These are happening right now to real people, these stories. Do you think the wise old, wise old owl came because of that, because of them being wise and being our ancestors in the sense? Well, the wise uh, owl definitely traces back to Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. That's where we get the, that's where Athens in Greece gets its name, is mm, from, mm. From, from Athena. Athena had a, a little owl that would perch on her arm, and there's actually a, a species of owl called a little owl. It's a tiny little owl. It's, it's this delicate little, funny, cute owl, and that was her totem. That was her companion. So, you know, that's getting close to 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, let's say. And and now, 3,000 years later, you still have owls, you know, thumbtacked to the bulletin board in elementary school when at the end of each school year because people are graduating from school. So this same totem, the same mythology is still alive, still present, the wise owl. Um, my sense is, I can't prove this, it's just my, what a, you know, sort of a thought experiment, is that these ancient experiences... This is not the, I mean, whatever, Ruthie having that experience with an owl, I'm convinced that this has been going on all over the world since time began, since we were in the caves. And these experiences, oftentimes not necessarily just with death, but with other things, with, with challenging moments in people's lives, that this is where these, the mythology emerged from. Those were the seeds, these real life experiences were the seeds that later, you know, grew a crop of mythology. Great. Hey, Mark, thanks so much for the call. It's, it's good to actually hear from you. Thank you, Martin. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. You too. Uh, you know, speaking of, uh, someone, someone just uh, sent some things in the chat room uh, about, like, communication. Now, your first book was called Messengers. Did that have anything to do with any type of telepathy uh, or have there been... Re- reports of telepathy that you know like people say you know through abductions or if they have some close encounter that they have you know like a vision or some type of uh, telepathy there's a few accounts in the in the in the book of telepathy between the owl there's a wonderful story um of a woman um and she's oh i'm trying a complete blank on her name she wrote the book she she coined the term exopolitics I'm drawing a blank on her name right now. I, I feel so bad. I'll, I'll remember it before the story's up. She, um, very early on, she was living in Phoenix. Very early on in her uh, her life experience with, she was coming to terms with her contact experiences. She was basically like, like coming to terms at that point that she had been having abduction experiences, contact experiences. She's very cautious. She doesn't like to use the term abduction. Um, and she... Uh, was walking out of a, like just in a strip mall in the suburbs of Phoenix. And she looked up and on a telephone, not a pole, on a light post was an owl. And it was big and she looked up at it and it looked down at her and she got a direct telepathic message. And it was, the, the came from the owl that was, you are not who you seem to be. Hmm. Which is wonderful. And, um, and then, 
so yes, and I have a handful of stories where the owls give these sort of cryptic messages. One woman went hiking. She went on a hike and she felt she'd had UFO contact experiences. And she was like, today is the day I am going to meet an alien. I know it. I know today's the day. So she, and she had also been doing a lot of fairy research, like ancient fairy lore. And um, she goes into the woods and she's kind of taken, it's like, oh, now I feel like I should walk off the path. And she walks and sort of goes through the woods and says, oh, walk a little bit over here. So she kind of gets this, she's kind of drawn over here. So then she kind of feels like, oh, I'm supposed to sit on this rock. And she sits on the rock. Well, no, not quite here, a little over to the left. Oh, not that far left, a little back. And just, so she sits there. It's like, what am I doing here? And then she realizes where she's sitting, there's like a little tunnel in the bushes, the one spot where she could sit and sort of see through this tunnel that's kind of a little gully and there's this tunnel on the other side of, of bushes. So she's lined up and locked eyes with a great horned owl. Hmm. And her first thought, she thought it in her mind, was like, are you an alien or are you a fairy? And she got the direct telepathic message why can't I be both? <laughs> You're both. Which is wonderful, which is another like perfect like Zen Cohen of an answer, which is exactly what emerges from these stories. So yes, the answer is there's some, though it doesn't happen very often, telepathic messages that come from all of us. The messengers, the reason the book is titled The Messengers is because that's what was showing up in my, my stories. People would just say, well, I saw an owl and they would call it the owl in the first sentence. And then they would call it the messenger in the second sentence. Really? Like it was delivering a message. Yeah. So presently, present day, so this is back to this mythology thing. Um, Harry Potter has an owl that delivers the mail. It's perfect. Right? This is modern day. This is present day mythology. Mythology in our pop culture, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a series of books. Also a series of movies. Harry Potter has an owl that delivers the mail. It could not be cleaner. It's, the, it's a messenger. It's perfect. And then I follow that up with J.K. Rowling, if you spell it out, has owl right in her name. Um, I don't, that's, a, that's a tiny little synchronicity. I don't, I'm not going to start a new religion on that one. But, um, but that, uh, that to me is more of, more of how my brain works rather than, than you know, what, what really might be there. So. So a lot of this, I've heard the word synchronicity, and I do remember, there, there's, that's a lot of what this is about, right? Well, the first book has synchronicity right in the title. And, and uh, so synchronicity is a term coined by um, Carl Jung to describe a meaningful coincidence um, where, where, you know, sure, you can have a coincidence, but if there's a deeper meaning to the, to the coincidence, that's when it... Um, that's when I sort of pay attention to it. Now, the uh, you go to a UFO conference and you talk to someone, and you, someone has UFO contact experiences. You say, "Do you have a lot of synchronicities in your life?" People just roll their eyes, like they you, like they say, "I have so many synchronicities; it's off the chart." So every, and I'm, I feel strongly saying this: the people who have had UFO contact experiences have an increased amount of synchronicity. Now, I've said that before. I've said this to a close friend, and she rolled her eyes, and she's, she's pretty smart and savvy about these things, and she rolled her eyes, and she said, listen, anyone on a spiritual path will have a lot of synchronicities. And that little bell went off in my head, and I'm like, well, following that logic, then UFO contact is a spiritual path. You hmm. know, so that, that, and so I've, I've been... I've been framing it to a degree, fr uh, framing my research and framing how I do this, that, you know, this is a challenging experience to have UFO contact. It's not easy. And it is, it is, and the people who I've talked to who've had this experience, it's not 100%, though many have come out the other end like really wonderful, big-hearted people that are doing healing work. That was one of the things that showed up in the second book. All these people are doing this, this, this altruistic healing work. Um, whether you know, some of them are nurses in hospitals, and some of them are doing like, you know, Reiki work in in uh, in like New Age clinics. So, um, it seems to me that when I was uh, talking, I'm trying to remember the gentleman's name that wrote a book on the Flatwoods Monster, but someone had said something about that being an owl. Had you ever heard that story? 
Yeah, I covered that briefly in the first book. Where that, so what it was was that the debunkers said, you know, so the people are in the woods and they see this like fifteen foot tall robot that is like belching flames and yeah. smoke and stuff like that, and then and they said the color was basically gray of this big robot monster thing that they saw. This or and and uh, and the debunker said, oh, you just saw a great horned owl, which is kind of demeaning, right? I mean, you would think that. You know, people mm-hmm. living in a rural spot had seen owls before, and also the the um the debunkers wrote off the the Mothman sightings as a great horned or a great gray owl. I was me. just going to ask you that question. That's so weird. I was going to ask you if you thought that any part of the people mentioning the Mothman sightings had anything to do with the similarity of what you're looking into. Well, there's people have compared the book to John Keel in a way because I'm going down those avenues where I'm really like letting my and I'm speculating I don't have any answers but I'm going down the avenue of just let's let's pull in all the weirdness all the associated weirdness which is what Keel did in the Mothman prophecies so it's so there's you know what I do and this is silly in a way is I just buy the books on Kindle right and then you can type in owl and you can just find search the whole book Hmm. you know for for, and I like these books and so for you know seven dollars or something like that I can I can get the book find search it and look and see if owl shows up so owl does show up in the mothman prophecies in in uh, uh the silver bridge but it's mostly just the fact that the debunkers were dismissing it as like oh these you know country yokels they just saw a big owl and that's what they think it is ah. which i don't think is true yeah um wow so uh let's uh we have still we have about 20 minutes left and i saw bobby he calls in the show he just came in just got out of work uh we're talking owls, Bobby. If you'd like to uh, give us a call, uh, anyone can call in, and that number's up on the screen. Um, always good to hear from him and other people that call in often. Um, let's hear another one of the stories. Uh, I love these stories. Okay, hold on. Let me just. I got to open the book here, and let's because I, I, it's, I can. Some of it. Some of them take an hour to tell, so I don't want to. I don't want to. We don't have the time for those. There's a woman named Susan McLeod. And she, this is interesting because she, because like the the core story, the sort of big story of the book doesn't have any owls in it, but she had been seeing owls around her house. She has wonderful owl stories where she's a healer. She's one of these wonderful shamanic, radiant people. She had someone over their house and, and, and these two people had just lost their spouses, you know, so the people, the death, and they said, let's, they went into the backyard and prayed and they said like, like my husband loved owls and the, and the other person said my wife loved owls let's see an owl and then boom an owl lands on a branch and they walked right up to it and they took pictures of it and they've got these amazing pictures like close like right so they said they sat there for a half hour and and cried and and so this is on the land this is the house basically so she has owl stories that are associated but here's the story she they were a friend of her died she had a close friend who had died, and she was part Native American. Well, she's Canadian, so she has part of the she traced her lineage back to the Mi'kmaq tribe, which is a tribe in northern Maine and yep. in that part of Ontario and in, in Quebec. So she's in Ontario. Um, she has a teepee on her property. So she, as part of the the grieving ceremony, she burned some sage, lit a fire, sang, pounded the drum. She's in the teepee. It's late at night. And her, she feels like something brush against the side of the teepee. It's big. She's like, oh my God, there's a bear out there. Like, and so she peeks out the teepee. She's like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk back to the house. She sta- takes a few steps out of the teepee and right in the path is a family of five Sasquatch. Big Sasquatch, like right in the path. And they're staring at her and they, they lock eyes. And she has this moment of like, is this my time? Am I dead? Did I die? And then she's like backs back up into the teepee and she's like, holy crap. And then it really scares her. Like, oh my goodness. So she bangs the drum really loud. She puts a bunch of wood on the fire and then she cautiously peeks out of the teepee and looks on the path and there's nobody there. So she she runs back up to the house. But And when she does, the same five family of Sasquatch are now down away, downhill across this little creek and they're standing there in this pose. And she says it's like a, the pose of a of a family portrait. There's three kids in front and two big adults in the back. And that's her family. Two adults, three kids. 
She gets to the house. She wants to tell everyone. I just saw five Sasquatch in the yard. She opens the door and the kids are like, mom, something is going on in the house. Everything's going crazy. There's these like shadow beings in the house. And so they tell these like dark shadow beings are zipping around the house. And, and she, she's, she's like, a, she's like the medicine woman of the neighborhood. So she burns the sage. She declares that these, they're, they have to leave. She can't tell her kids, right? How does she tell her kids? Her kids are all freaked out. So she burns sage and she she got to tell, I got to tell my partner. So she runs down and her, her partner is in the garage and he's got a woodworking thing there. So she runs down and she wants to tell him about the Sasquatch. So she tries to go in, but the door's locked. Not only is the door locked, but he's like jammed wood into the door. Like, so he, sh- so he can't, <laughs> so like, she's like, let me in. And he's like, what the hell is going on? What, what this, what it, there are these shadow beings here in the garage. They're zooming around. So she's like, oh, my God, here, too. So she, <clears throat> she's like, what do I? So she steps away from the garage for a second, and she looks up to the stars, and she, she prays. She prays to God. She's Catholic. She was raised Catholic. And she prays to God, and she says, I need answers. I need help. And at that moment, she's looking up at the stars, and this giant triangle is blotting out the stars directly above her. In this, this giant UFO triangle. And she said it gets lower and it's right above the trees, above her driveway. And her husband's there. He sees it too. And it's, it's, it's not physical in like a concrete kind of way. It's like flitting in and out of reality. Like it's like a little, like a video that's on static. And she's like, oh my gosh, these are like, this is all related. The, so the, the, her sense is the shadow beings aren't like, members of a they, that's not something you see in a haunted house and the sasquatch aren't big hairy apes that live in the woods and the flying saucer or the the triangle ufo's aren't aren't a spaceship from another planet this is all somehow interwoven and this is on a site on our property where she has there are so many beautiful owl stories i just i could only tell a few in the book but um so this is so here's a woman her she loves owls. She has this experience. And she's also helping people. She's doing a lot of volunteer work helping people using her psychic skills to, you know, if it's to be believed, the way she describes it, to help people, like, get over serious illnesses. Hmm. Uh, we, we, had a, we had a question come in. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, we had a question come in, come in about deer. I know you talked about deer earlier. And this guy wrote, this came in through email twice just now. Twice I've seen deer while coming home late at night, which is normal because we live where there are deer all around. Uh, but all I saw was quick in my head lights as I came around the corner in the neighbor's yard and it was looking directly at me so I could see the front of the body. And both times it was tall and unusually thin. Both disappeared when I lost eye contact. Have you ever heard of a story like that? The answer is, well, not exactly like that, but, but certainly stories that have the same flavor. So, yes, you hear, you know, it's like there's a story that, like, I can't, I can't sum up an investigation just by hearing that thing. But, yes, so that, that's a little red flag. As me as an investigator and a researcher, a red flag goes off. And I'm like, ooh, there might be more to this story. My website is called Hidden Experience. It's, it's my website. It's based on my own experiences. So, I'm... Like I would say, it's hard to know, but that that's very telling. Excellent. I okay. have one friend who saw a gray horse. He said, I don't know if it was a horse or a deer. He was jogging, right? He was doing a half marathon. And he said he, was, he measured it from his house to the spot. And he would, and he was, no, he, so he was, he was, he drove there. And saw he went on a road he did, usually doesn't go down and saw this gray horse. He said it didn't make any sense. Really scared him, and he got in his car and drove back. And he like plotted this out. He said, "I'm doing a half marathon. I can jog to the spot and then jog back, right? That works out. That's for training. So I know exactly the mileage." So he gets there. There's no road there. There was no road that he went down to see this gray horse. That is weird. That scared him. Yes. So this is the kind. This is. This is, and, and as I said before, this is the kind of stuff that floats my boat. These are the stories I love, these weird, open-ended stories. We have another call just in that right now. Um, good timing. Uh, welcome to the show, and please give your first name and where you're calling from. 
Hi, I'm Eva from Hamburg in Germany. Oh, welcome. Hi. <laughs> uh, just a short, um, just a short message. Um, I had an UFO sighting, and uh, in, uh, three weeks ago. And uh, afterwards, I suddenly heard uh, owls hooting. That was all. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> isn't it like two, and, three o'clock in the morning for you right now? <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I'm following the show. <laughs> uh, well, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mike, you want to comment? Nice because, yeah. You know, pardon, I, I'm living uh, in the city and it's very unusual to hear owls. I mean, I have never heard owls in all of my life before, you know. And, uh, well, th this was unusual. So the, I cannot, like, answer what may have been going on here. But what I can say is that from my experience doing this sort of research, I think you should take that UFO sighting seriously. Th if this owl I is do. a mess. Yes. And, and, I, so, and can you tell me more about the sighting? What happened? Um, well, nothing much, you know, but I've been having dreams before and um, UFO sightings, um, several actually, and uh, well, this was just fitting in. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I, ca I can't say anything more, but uh, it was very enlightening, um, and I felt good afterwards. I felt uh, sort of what can I say, loved or something. This is I so what, good. yeah, so what you're saying is very telling. And, and I, so the, the clue of the owl is, in my opinion, is a, is a call to, is a wake-up call, right? So it's an alarm clock. Like you have an alarm clock in the morning to wake you up, and that's what the owl is there to do. And that's one way to look at it. I don't know your story completely, but I would say... You know, don't turn your back on these UFO experiences. Go towards them. Dig into them. Do the hard work. It's going to oh, be yes, challenging. Been, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, suddenly, I've been doing that for a number of years now. <laughs> and, uh, yes, I take it seriously. I do. Yes. Well, Thank you. Yeah, good. No, that's remarkable. And if you want to contact me, it's easy to get a hold of me through my site. I would love to hear more. Excellent. Um, Yes, uh, of course, yeah. I've uh, kept a dream journal. Um, things have been going on ever since I was a little child. So, uh, you know. <clears throat> and uh, it's only recently that I've uh, started to get into UFOs because um, um, I kept dreaming of UFOs and, and seeing little people, you know. <laughs> And uh, so I, I started to search on the internet, and uh, things turn up in my mind. And uh, yeah, I've been interested now. Well, thank you so much for the call. And, yes, thank uh, you. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Okay. Danke. Thank you very much. Okay. Danke. All right. Thank okay. You. Yeah. Avida. Avida. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Bye. 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 We have another caller on the line. Uh, caller, your first name and where are you calling from? Hey, Martin. This is Eric from Los Angeles. Hi, Eric. How are you? Thanks for calling. Uh, you have a question for our guest? Well, uh, no. I've got a story. I, uh, oh, sure. I think I've got my yeah, yeah. owl story for Mike Clellan. Okay, yes, let's hear it. <laughs> so, uh, I've always uh, how do I how do I start this off? Okay, so basically, uh, in 2014, uh, you were talking about how <clears throat> uh, owls and change, like what's going on with people's life when when owls start to maybe creep in, right? Somehow, or UFOs, and, I would say, or UFOs. <laughs> oh God, don't get me don't get me frightened. So <laughs> the the. The, I guess what I'm trying to say is, because um, I believe in, I believe in these owls and synchronistic events, and I totally believe in UFOs. But in 2014, I had just kind of started to brush up on UFOs, and <clears throat> I learned of your book. In fact, I think I listened either to you on 
either Jimmy Church or, or the, maybe uh, Martin's program. I can't remember which, but it just rung a bell with me. I was just fascinated by this, and I thought, God, I've lived in cities all my life. I've never really seen owls. I've never, to my knowledge, seen a UFO, but this is uh, resonated. And I just instantly thought there's something to this. And so I've always been fascinated by your book or now books and any chance I could uh, get to listen to one of your interviews, I would, I would go and look for it. And so, <clears throat> um, side note, whenever something strange would happen in my life or has happened in my life, strange or significant, Mike, uh, I begin to have not dreams about necessarily the event, but just very odd dreams. Uh, there's the, the, the high strangeness in my dreams really uh, kicks up. And, uh, you know, I don't wake up with objects or any feeling like I've experienced anything, but I can just remember the dreams more vividly is a better way to put it. So uh, it's 2015 now, and we're living, me and my two brothers were living in San Pedro, uh, which is uh, just you look straight off of San Pedro and you can see Catalina Island, okay? And uh, I start to have these very intense, very weird dreams, and I start to um, just think, oh, this, something's going to happen again. And my father passes away unexpectedly. He was old, but it was unexpected, and he and I were not on good terms. And within, I'm going to say a week or ten days of it, I started to see owls at night and I don't know if they were always there or if I maybe uh, you know maybe maybe they did come into my life some way but I just thought it was a really strange there, there's something to this synchronicity and I think it's George Norrie who's always said it best like there really is no coincidence in this world so I just thought I would call it in and let you know that I thought the, the book is fantastic. I think there's something to it. I'm a pretty skeptical person, and even I have uh, recognized the synchronicity of what you're talking about. Excellent. Eric, thank you so much for the call. Oh, you bet. Thanks, guys. Bye. Yes, those owls showing up shortly after the death of a parent is is remarkably consistent in, in what I'm getting. That's, that is very common. And I'm, and as I said earlier, I think it's very common. I think it's, I think, you know, people had the same experience, you know, out in front of their cave, you know, and, and the people are now having the same experience, you know, out there in front of their apartment. And do you think those are, these owls, do you think they're nothing but owls in this circumstance? And they just, what do you, what do you think's going on? I mean, I, I yeah, know I it's a mystery yeah, in general. Real owls, sure. Yeah. Real owls. I mean, I've had, you know, I've, uh, yes. So that's the question, isn't it? Like, well, how does this owl? Like, how does how do the chess masters of reality like move the pawns on the chessboard? So, so you know, the the grieving child is is confronted with the the real owl. You know, in a in a way that they can see it. Wow. Uh, we have time for one more call if someone would like to call in, but uh, kind of a short call, and that number is six zero three. Nine six seven four zero three zero. Just took the number down. Sorry about that, but it's uh, again live call only during the show. Six zero three nine six seven four zero three zero. One other question had come in: uh, Have you ever co collaborated with any other abduction researchers where they had similar witnesses, uh, witness accounts involving owls? Well, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I go. I mean, so what happens is. I, when I, I was I worked with Bud Hopkins when I was looking into my own experiences, and wow. I worked with Bud or with uh, Leo, and and I spent some time with um, David Jacobs and Barbara Lamb. And you ask these people, all of them, like, do you have any odd experiences, odd st stories show up with owls? And they look at you like, of course, they show up all the time. We get owl stories all the time, and then they'll go on to describe the the uh, the screen memory aspect. So that's not really where my my you know that's the thread that I want to pull is those real owls, the mystery of the real owls, as opposed to the four foot tall owls or the owls that you know. Um, so you know, I, this this is very 
Um, yeah, so people are well aware of this. And now what's happening, oh, Rosemary Guiley has been wonderful uh, as far as being helpful in my research. So um, as well as, um, so here's, so there's a the fellow who wrote, He's a, he also does abduction research and UFO research, but he's mostly known for the black-eyed children. His name is David Weatherly. So he told me a wonderful story where he was going to the house of someone who had had UFO contact and the the was a mom and there were some kids in the house and so he was they were talking about what felt like repeated UFO contact at the house so he went there to interview him as part of his research and he is also a shaman he doesn't talk about this much um, but he's he was he's open with it he'll talk about it though he keeps it separate from his day job which is this paranormal research which is to me interesting because I can see the overlap so he goes to the house he pulls up in the driveway he's got a little voice recorder Right, so he's putting new batteries in the voice recorder. So he's looking down. He's not looking at his, you know, out in front of the car. He's in the driver's seat in front of this house, and then he he feels a palpable like thud, and like literally feels a little tap on the car, and he looks up, and there's a great horned owl standing on the hood of the car, through the windshield. <laughs> so this the shamanism thing shows up. I'm sure I mentioned it a few times here, but in this, so a shaman at the home of someone who's having UFO contact is looking looking into the eyes of an owl that lands on the roof of his car, on the hood of his car. Now, later, I had um, David Weatherly. He said, I wrote about shamanism in an essay. This essay was kind of the genesis, the foundation for the book, for what became the book. And he, um, I sent it off to him, and I said, listen, can you read this? And just, you know, I don't, I don't want to be talking out of my hat as far as the shamanism stuff, because I'm not an expert. And he read through it, and he said, oh, this is a good essay. Was, he made a couple very simple changes, which I put into the document. And he said, oh, I've got a story for you. I was like, well, what's up? And he said, well, I was reading the document. I was on my computer. I was reading it on the computer. And um, I was at my desk, and then fl- there's this thing flitted by the window. So I looked out the window, and there was an owl on the branch. I think it was actually on a, on a power line, on the on the." Uh, power line outside his window and I said how many times uh, have you seen an owl out your window I said oh I've never seen an owl out my window how long have you lived at this house oh 20 years so he's a shaman is reading an essay about shamanism written by a guy that's interested in the owl stuff and as he's doing it he sees an owl out his window this is yes, this is hard to like 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 what really happened behind the scenes? I like I want to sit with the scriptwriters of reality and like see how they like, you know, like what they're thinking. I mean, because if this was in a movie, if someone had written this in a movie, I would, you know, and I was the executive producer, I'd walk into the scriptwriting room and go, "Hey guys, um, this is getting a little corny. Why don't you tone it down a little bit?" You know. <laughs> uh, well, uh, well, hey, it's uh, it looks like the end of our show, Mike. Uh, it's always a lot of fun talking to you, and hopefully we'll uh, cross paths again at another conference. I sure hope so, yeah. 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 Are you doing any speaking engagements? I have one lined up in in the in October in I think it's October, I got a in um in Quebec. So in oh. Montreal. Yep. French speaking conference. They're gonna have translators for me and it's a, it's really funny because it's a it's a scientific, it's a heavily scientific talk about um UFOs. And it's at a college. It's being treated seriously. And I, I got on the phone with the guy who's doing the conference. And my first word, I was like, what are you talking to me for? I'm not a scientist. Like, I'm the most unscientific guy imaginable as far as trying to do this. And he's like, no, no, no. We we want you there. And, and he, so anyway, it was a wonderful conversation. And, and I, I was like, yikes, what am I getting myself into? So, <laughs> yeah, so that's coming up in October in Quebec. That might slow you down a little bit. That's all. <laughs> oh, being- the translations. No, they have the little, they have, it's like being at the UN. They, oh, they have like, it's all well, fancy. Where, like, the French speaking people like put oh, on yeah. little headsets. Yeah, I guess oh, you're on a nice. you're in a, Yeah. Yeah, excellent. All right, so go ahead and if you would toss your uh, blogs out there one more time, and that'll My do it for us. My blog is, oh, and I'll do, just, so I did look it up here while we were talking. So I, it's the name of her blog is at Spiral's End, but the URL is for this woman, Lucretia Hart, her oh, wonderful yes. blog. Uh, is spirals dash end dot live journal dot com. I think spirals end, if you type that in there, UFOs, it would come right up. But I'll read it again spirals dash end dot live journal dot com. My website is hidden experience dot blogspot dot com. You can also find me at mike dot com. And if you can't remember of any of that, just 
Google UFOs and owls, and you will find me. I will be right at the top of the list. Excellent. All right, Mike. You take care. Thanks so much. It was a joy. All right. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Yes. All right. Take care. Thanks now. All right, everyone. So we are uh, all out of show, and thank you so much. Uh, we'll be back next week with uh, Ellie Maloney. Uh, she, uh, I believe she's a European um, lady, and she's written a fiction, fiction book, but uh, has some pretty interesting insights. We'll be talking to her next week. And uh, thanks so much for listening. And uh, again, we'll be back same time next week. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. Thank you.